everybody. Welcome back. I'm Susan Lindner, your host of the Innovation Storyteller Show. This is the place where we come for not just the innovation, but the stories we tell to get the innovation to their finish line. And that's why I'm excited to bring a whole different perspective to startups, financing startups, thinking about how we invest in and grow innovation in large companies as part of the startup ecosystem, as part of the innovation ecosystem. And perhaps for some of my long-term listeners who don't necessarily have a venture function or an investing function in small businesses that have are really creating breakthrough technologies, what's a way to get in on what's this revolution in venture capital studios that are springing up all over the world and really have been around with us for quite some time now. But maybe now in 2024, it's a time to pay attention to thinking about how we're sourcing the best ideas on the planet and bringing them into our organizations to enhance the products that we're working on, to consider new streams of revenue, or even really to reconsider potentials for moonshots way down the road from now by looking at the startups who are making breakthroughs in technology today. And that's why I'm so excited to have T.A. McCann on the show. He is the managing director of Pioneer Square Labs. And T.A. and I met at the Institute for Innovation at Larger Organizations, ILO, headed up by a wonderful guy named Peter Temis. And I just adore that conversation. And T.A. was kind enough to share with our group all of the breakthroughs that are taking place at Pioneer Square Labs. Um, is a serial entrepreneur. He was the founder and CEO of Synosis, which was acquired by Google, GIST, which was acquired by BlackBerry, and Rival IQ, a leader in marketing analytics. And before that, he was the entrepreneur in residence at Polaris Venture Partners, Vulcan Capital, where he built Vulcan Labs, and Providence Health Services, which focused on quantified health ideas and investments. He also held senior roles at Microsoft, leading exchange and mobile services divisions, and even as his own startup experience as an active angel investor in companies, including Skilljar and Creative Live, Assist, Migo, and Vendorhawk. And he's on the board of a couple of phenomenal organizations. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Washington Foster School of Business and an active tech stars mentor. Okay. I'm not even going to mention the fact that you may or may not have been a professional sailor and have competed in two different America's Cups. I'm going to talk about your 1-1 record shortly <laughs> and the whip bed around the world race. So if you're looking for someone who uh, has a wee bit of courage they might like to share with the rest of us, we're going to be talking about all things Venture Studios today. So thank you for joining me, TA. So fun to be here. Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction. Yeah. Okay. So first off, so you go from being this incredible professional sailor. How did you even get to this place working in innovation? How do we get off the boat and into the tech space? Well, I'm a mechanical engineer as a background, and I my first jobs out of college were building robotic systems. And I'd had a dream as a kid to do this round the world race. And so I'd pursued that for a long period of time. And after I got out of college, I said, this is about the time to try and figure out how to do that. So through a number of different connections and events, <clears throat> I got an opportunity to try out for the America's Cup. And that's a once in a lifetime type of thing. Was sort of drafted last, last on the team. And hopefully we showed up and then ultimately won that America's Cup. So it was a little bit like joining a startups. And then that's the one that goes public. You had a small role. You just got on the team and that happened to be the one that turned out really well. That led to the round the world race that led to the next America's cup. And I was always sort of the technical guy on the team with my engineering background. And so 1995 rolls around the internet starts to happen. And the owner of one of my teams said, what's going on with this whole internet thing? And I was really intrigued. I was interested too. I mean, this was effectively Netscape had just gone public. Microsoft was talking about this and, and I had sort of run a little bit of the course of sailing. Coincidentally, I was sailing with Larry Ellison, the co-founder or the founder of Oracle as well at the time. And I just got very interested. And so I said, Hey, why don't you pay me $20 an hour over the winter? I will build us a website. I will learn about the internet and we'll end up with a unique asset. And that was the beginning of the transition out of sailing 
and then back into technology. And so I got I built my first company was a web development company. I built V1s of many different web properties and got to be relatively good in that transition from sort of 95 through 97, 98. And then I started my, my next real, I would say, software company in, in 98. Wow. So we'll step over the fact that you're clearly overcharging your web customers for your <laughs> services. But moving into this new space, help my listeners really get a sense of the venture studio and how it's different from venture capital in general, especially for my corporate listeners who are really trying to understand what's the best way for me to get connected with the startup ecosystem if I'm not actively working with them now. Mm -hmm. Let me just do a little bit of, of chronology to get us to that point. So the second, the first company was successful. The second company, I went through the dot-com crash and that went out of business. So I failed in my second startup. I ran out of money and, and I saw sort of some of the external things that help early entrepreneurs be successful or fail. That led me to Microsoft. And I did a lot of sort of side projects, small, innovative things at Microsoft. For example, I ran the hosted exchange business as the cloud was starting to happen. It's 2001, Gmail had just really launched Microsoft Exchange, which many of our corporate listeners would sort of still run on or now become Office 365. But I was really advocating for running that in the cloud and running that as a managed service. And this is again, 2001, 2002. So I had sort of this feeling of entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship inside of a large corporation where everybody was sort of very focused on the traditional deployment model of exchange. And I was really focused on a new deployment model of exchange. So I'd felt a little bit of that internal sort of work, worked at Microsoft for a couple, three years. It was a little bit too slow for me, but I'd started a number of other initiatives inside of Microsoft in that intrapreneurship -y sort of way. Mm -hmm. That led me to Polaris. That led me to Vulcan Labs. That led me to the first studio experience I had. And we worked on a number of projects for Paul. Paul Allen was the co-founder of Microsoft. He ran Vulcan Capital and Vulcan Labs. And so I worked for Paul for a while and worked and got kind of good at this sort of how quickly can we come up with ideas, kill ideas, move ideas forward. And the, the fifth idea we worked on meaningfully became GIST. And I fell in love with that and I left to go run it. So I left Vulcan Labs, became a founder again. And then did three more. That was acquired by BlackBerry. Then I did Rival IQ. That was acquired by NetBase. Then I did Synosis. That was acquired by Google. And I was thinking about doing yet another company when one of my mentors and friends, Brad Feld, sort of really encouraged me to think about maybe this is a time to spend a little time with a lot of companies instead of a lot of time with one. And that was a good opportunity. I knew the PSL team, Pioneer Score Labs or PSL for short. I knew the PSL team along the way. I was an early angel investor with PSL, but there was an opportunity for me to continue to work with Brad, who's a large investor in PSL, to productize entrepreneurship, for lack of a better description, to bring a lot of my own personal experience and try to normalize that across a lot of companies. And, and that was Pioneer Square Labs. I joined about five years ago. And now bringing us forward to that. So Pioneer Square Labs has really three parts of our business. We're a startup studio, or some people would think about that as an incubator, where we come up with brand new ideas for software-based companies, and we turn them into companies. Over the last eight years doing PSL, we've tested north of 400 ideas to turn them into 36 different brand new companies. The second part of our business is we are a venture capital fund. So we have a $100 million venture capital fund. We invest in early stage technology companies based in the Pacific Northwest. We write 500K to $2 million checks. So we're usually the first professional money into the companies we start, yes, and also companies we don't start. So we're seeing a compare and contrast on early stage companies that are here. And then the third part of our business is bringing those skills to corporate partners. So we co-create companies with a number of other large organizations where they may or may not have the skills or the capabilities to build those companies at the same rate. So we're doing the studio work, the venture work, and the co-creation work as the three legs of the PSL stool. So how do they compare out of curiosity? I didn't know that there was that juxtaposition happening in your work too. How do they compare from the ones that you incubate to the ones that you invest in separately? Well, in terms of success, they're quite similar. So mm -hmm. they may come from different origins, but they actually converge to looking like pretty similar companies within, I would say, the first year of their life. So they may come from different ways, but if you imagine at the end of the first year of life, they would have raised external capital from a new VC. They might be 
six to 10 to 15 people. They've got early good customer traction. And so regardless of whether they come from the corporate side, the studio side, or the venture side, they start in different places, but they converge to looking quite similar again after that first round of external capital. And then I don't, we don't necessarily see a tremendous difference between the success and failure of the origin. So there are ones that succeed and fail from the studio and succeed and fail from the corporate side and succeed and fail from the venture side. There's not a huge correlation between where they originated and their, I'll say, near-term success, which is part of the reason to do the studio, is part of the, we can use that same playbook and bring the different parts that are necessary to any one company to get them to a much higher likelihood of success than they might have, regardless of where they sort of started. So walk us through this process, right? So what was fascinating to me when you presented at ILO was the speed with which you are doing this, because incubators can also be many months, right? I mean, I've seen a bunch of founders kind of dilly dally and try new things, but like you're like, you're really persistent. You're pedal to the metal on this, trying to get to an outcome in a very short period of time. Talk to us about the timeframes and how it works. Yeah. So we, our orientation across PSL is really to create high value equity. So when you're equity oriented, meaning you're trying to create lots of companies where your equity is valuable, you have to start thinking hard about your time versus being consulting in orientation, which is like, Hey, if it takes a long time, that's fine. For us, we're equity oriented. And when we co-create these companies, especially with large organizations, our partners, we both are equity oriented. So we are trying to get a standalone company where we both own meaningful equity in that company. Therefore, speed is an important part of us. So the PSL process tends to run through sort of five stages, which is ideation, validation, creation, spin out, and scale up. There are critical decisions that happen at each point. So between ideation and validation, is this a good idea that we're excited about where we might have unique opportunity to do something with it. At the end of validation, we feel like we found a venture scale opportunity. We go find or confirm a CEO. The end of creation is the day the company is founded and the end of spin out is the day the company is VC funded. So it's really like, can we find an idea we're excited about that is a venture scale where we're excited about the founder and we can get it funded. And those are the really big steps along the way. The fastest we've ever done that whole process is six weeks. So from idea to spin out in six weeks, and then that company was funded subsequently and continues to scale nicely. And coincidentally, that was actually our first company we did with our biggest corporate partner. TeamSense is the name of the company and Fortive, our partner. We did that whole thing in six weeks. More normally, it's about a three month long process. So more normally, it's about a month to six weeks in validation. And I can talk in detail about stuff that dies early in validation and stuff that dies, I'll call it late in validation. And then it's usually one to two months in creation. And that depends a little bit on how complicated the product is, how successful we were finding the right CEO, how much momentum we have on what we would call product market pull. And so it varies a little bit in that creation phase, but more, most normally it's kind of three to four months from the time we start working an idea to the time that it actually becomes a company. So talk to us about this six week. I mean, that's not a sprint. That's a run for your life. Like that is just (laughs) incredible to me. And the fact also that these ideas are being grown and nourished without a founder behind it, right? You're coming up with a concept and then identifying the right founder to run it. Am I getting that right? Sometimes. So we generate ideas in four separate ways. So one way would be what we call PSL led. That means us sitting around and coming up with a brand new idea. And then we'll have to go find a founder CEO for that idea for sure. Hmm. Number two would be founder led. So we do have a bunch of our companies now where it's a single founder. It's a person that has a, an idea and they really want to accelerate that idea into the market. And that could be a founder led idea. So now you've solved one of the variables is, okay, we know that we're going to work with this particular person when we're evaluating them at the same time as we're evaluating the idea. A third would be corporate led. And in certain cases, like TeamSense, the CEO of TeamSense actually came from Fortive. And so she was very quickly involved. And part of the reason that company went so fast is because we had two co-founders actually. So Sheila, who's the CEO and Allison, who was the venture lead, they both were there from day one. And so we had a very tight alignment on 
vision and execution and good people who were there. So that was a fortive idea, but very quickly we had a, a founder there. And then last we call them network led ideas, which are usually VCs who bring us ideas that want to co-create them with us. But yes, the founder, the dynamic of finding the founder, whether they bring the idea or not, is often something that speeds an idea up very rapidly or in fact slows it down. So we've had plenty of ideas where we are very excited about it. We'd find product market poll and we just never found the right CEO founder for it. And they sit on the backlog waiting for us to either put attention toward them or stumble across a person who we think is great from a functional perspective and is looking for a category or a specific idea that we might be excited about. And then we dust those off the pile and get back into them and revalidate them all over again. Wow. So I, I think that's fascinating because we need these little like innovation libraries, archives, right? Where we can hold on to these ideas. It is like rotting fruit though, right? Until you find that, until you find that perfect mix of founder idea and market, because the idea can very quickly be swept up by somebody else, right? You have to be pretty cognizant of, I would always hear this from venture capitalists. One of my first clients when I was in tech PR was Battery Ventures. Mm -hmm. And you would hear from around the world, the same idea kind of popcorning as technology improves and people see the same synergies happening. So you really have to, when you see these great ideas popping up, I mean, it's, it must be incredible the pressure it feels to go and find the right person to run it. Yes, that's right. And, and the fastest kills that we have are on competitive landscape. So as mm -hmm. soon as you come up with a concept, you go Google it, you go do a little competitive landscaping and all of a sudden you're like, oh, there's 90 guys doing the same thing that are already funded by good VCs and we crumple that up idea and throw it away. Because unless we have something that feels like a unique competitive advantage against what we can perceive from those people, and oftentimes because our networks are large, where it's easy for us to call up Battery and say, hey, it looks like you guys invested in ABC company. We're thinking about doing something similar. And is there, and we may pitch our own idea right back against those people who would say like, oh, no, that's what you're doing. It sounds very different than what company A is doing. But we get, we kill a lot of ideas very rapidly on customer or on competitive landscape. The most likely next kill is we have a good concept. We scream out into the internet. We look for customers and no one cares. So lack of customer pull or customer awareness or customer eagerness and all of that is an important part of the process too. But yes, finding and acting quickly. This is another reason why oftentimes corporations have a hard time acting at the pace of that is required when yes, many people see the same set of characteristics in the world, the why now moment for anything, which could be sometimes technology enablement. Like obviously in this moment of AI, many of us are seeing new capabilities coming online that will enable certain kinds of companies that might not have been enabled or be able to be done two years ago. It's difficult for large corporations to act like that. Even if they wanted to act like that, it's diff difficult for them to find the resources to prototype, to go do customer discovery. And then it's even more difficult for them to find the kind of people who could go be CEOs of those kinds of companies. And all of these are the reasons that, that large corporates often work with a startup studio like ourselves. Walk us through what it's like. So you're working with a large Fortune 500 company. I know I have lots of chief innovation officers listening. How does it work? How do you begin to form this partnership together? Because there's a lot of trepidation. I've heard from very large companies who say, we don't work with startups because we've murdered every startup that we've worked with our mm -hmm. own over-organization and localization needs and cybersecurity needs or what have you. Um, and oftentimes there's no internal advocate who's really desirous to stop doing the status quo and use this whole new thing. Like there, I imagine there needs to be quite a confluence of support for this kind of work. Uh, yes and no. So uh, I can play on the, the spectrum of very light involvement to very heavy involvement, but let's start on the light involvement level. So I could be sitting with somebody at a CEO level, a corporate strat level, or somewhere and say like, you know what, why are we not in this category? This is an important category for us to be in. And there's probably an opportunity there. Hey, PSL, let's go look at that. And, or they may say, we have a large customer base. Let's say you were McDonald's, for example, you have all of these franchise people who are running your organization. You're like, oh, and I know they need a solution to X and we're not going to build a solution to X. So you have large customer base or access to customers. You believe that they have a need and you don't think that you're going to satisfy that. So you can either be, I want to be in a category or I have large 
aggregated customer demand or theoretically customer demand. From that point forward, like then we can turn the machine on. Like we have the PSL machine that's like, okay, we're going to go do the customer value prop feature set, business model, customer discovery, customer development, prototyping, all of like we have all the people to do that. So you can be very light touch. Nobody has to do anything at the corporate other than what I just said. Hmm. And set us a way to go do that work. At the end of that work, let's assume in, in most cases it dies because of competitive landscape. Hey guys, here's seven companies doing the thing you just talked about. You should go look at them and work with them however you choose. Or, hey, we've talked to lots of customers and they don't seem to care. So maybe there's no opportunity, but let's assume the positive side. Let's assume a positive outcome where we understand the competitive landscape. We find strong product market poll or customer poll. We can imagine what a product is going to look like. We can start to even prototype some of that. We might even have identified a potential CEO. So let's assume that we're on the positive side of validation. The next thing was like, hey, we're going to go. We all think this is a good idea. Do you guys still think it's a good idea? Yes. Great. Okay. Let's move forward. Let's hire this potential CEO and we'll move it in this creation phase of what we do. At that point, we're all leaning forward. We're all leaning toward, yes, this is likely to be a company. And we now have a CEO who's pulling it or pushing it. We have us who's excited about it. And we've had, yes, a green light from the corporate to say, yes, we're still excited about it. There's only one more decision and that's the spin out decision. And effectively at that point in time, the CEO is now pitching it back to all of us as if we were venture investors. And we are, of course, venture investors. And that's the only decision that's really required is like, yep, we're going to go. And we're going to go with Jane as the CEO and Jane's plan to go do this particular thing. And then the rest of the machine keeps going. It's pretty, we create the company, we spin it out, and now it's Jane's company. And we put capital into it. And now it looks like any other startup where Jane has the opportunity to go run that company in the same way that anyone else would. And it's now abstracted away from all of the corporate overhead, all of the people who want to kill it, all of the people who think it's their domain, all of the people who don't want to resource it or whatever. So you've now pushed it out into a place where it's autonomous. It's gonna go run its course and Jane is in charge. She really doesn't have to have much more involvement from the corporate. That's the lightest touch. Now mm -hmm. in a heavier touch mode, the corporate partner can be very helpful, incredibly helpful. Oftentimes in customer discovery, customer development, like here's the customer list, let's go get, let's go talk to more of them together. Or how might we accelerate this company and market? How do we put them on stage at our conference? How do we give them some PR help? How do we help them with awareness? How do we introduce them to more people in our network? So these are all ways you can amplify, but they're not required. They're just better if they happen that way. Yeah, because that, I mean, <laughs> I'm an anthropologist by training, but I, I think of like that new thing coming in and a lot of people on the show have described it as like, you bring this new baby into the world and there are several fiefdoms inside of the corporation that are ready to kill it on day one. Yeah, that's um, true. Yeah, only because it upsets the apple cart in a way that people have inherent fear about, right? Of like what could happen next. So but that's, can I interrupt? So, so just the, that is so, why it's so important to create a brand new entity with a CEO with their capital, with their opportunity to run at the pace that they want, that is no longer, other than a board seat, no longer under the control of the corporation. And it's its own company and it's far enough away. Now that's different than when you acquire something in, and I've been in that, I've been a CEO of a, being acquired. I mean, BlackBerry acquired my company, Google acquired a different one of my companies. <clears throat> Both of those ideas are now dead. Both of those technologies sit inside those corporations and never really materialize in value. So I've experienced personally what happens in the opposite direction for yeah. any number of reasons. And we can certainly talk about how maybe you do M&A better, how you do integration better. I mean, certainly we could talk about that as another theme, but this is really about getting the idea out. And as soon as it gets out, then whatever those antibodies that might live inside the corporation of, hey, this is my fiefdom, this is my domain, this is on my roadmap, that's all now gone. It's now separated in such a way that regardless of whatever VP of product wants to do, that is no long, they're no longer in control of the resources or they're no longer in control of the strategy because now that's a different entity. It's out in the world by itself and Jane's doing what she's going to do. And they might still perceive it as a threat even out there. But yeah, but it, no control to do anything about no it. Anything. Re realistically, no control to do anything it. about it. I mean, they could have a board seat on it. And, but in many ways now you're like, okay, there's usually a large product unit 
if it's a small product unit trying to do the same thing internally, they may perceive it, but you have two small people working on the same thing. Or it could be a large product unit that thinks that was in their domain, but they should perceive it. That's eh, just a little bitty company over there. What are they really doing? That's just a startup. We should be able to win easily against said startup. And the CEO of Nuco should have a good sense of whether they're friend or foe at the corporate level. But the control part of this is really important. Who's in control? And VP of product can say whatever they want, but the CEO of Nuco is now out in the world and executing in the way that she thinks is right to go run that company. So when, when an innovation leader is thinking about, gosh, there's this idea, we see this thing coming over the horizon. We want to find a way to capitalize on this thing, or we have an idea of something that's even far more pinpointed that we could develop internally, or maybe we should consider other methods. What's the story that you tell these large companies, TA, about how to consider this as an option for their own exploration and development? Yeah. So depending on someone's organizational structure, there may be somebody who's generally in charge of this kind of category of things. Mm -hmm. And it could be corp strat, it could be innovation, but someone is usually horizon one, horizon two, horizon three type of things. Now that may be delegated down to a, a given product unit, like the exchange unit versus office versus something else. And each one of them may have their own functional, like where do we want to be in three years or five years or 10 years? But let's assume that at a corporate level, someone is plotting out with a board and or a CEO, like what categories should we be in and why should we be in those categories? And then there starts to down a decision tree. So one would be like, should this just be a feature of one of our products? Great. Okay. Put that your engineering team on it and start prototyping it. That's great. Should it be a standalone business unit inside of our corporation for any number of reasons? Okay, great. To also organizationally know how to do that. Should this be a standalone company outside the walls of the corporate for any number of good reasons? And in that use case, that's the part of the decision tree where you could say, well, how might we execute that? One of the ways to do that is with a startup studio, or you could execute that with corporate venture capital. You could say, oh, well, let's just invest in a set of companies that have already done something like this, or let's attempt to invest in them. Or certainly you could invest in them and then run corporate M&A. Like, well, we're going to buy a company that's already doing something like that. And if you live underneath Corp Strat, or the function like that, there should be this build by partner create. And the build is the product team, the buy is M&A, the invest or could be create or the standalone, let's go create. We looked around, we didn't find anything we could invest in. We didn't find anything we could buy. So let's go create this company using a studio like PSL. And that approach is one that you're, who are you typically talking to internally? Is it a business leader? Is it a chief innovation officer? Is it a CEO? Where does that conversation begin? Yeah, it's in a best case, it is somebody who sits sort of in that functional role. And again, it could be a person who's innovation. It could be corp strat, could be corp M&A, that function, but they usually are only one step away from the CEO. Mm -hmm. They have to be high enough in the organization. They have to have enough sway within the organization to sort of kill some of the antibodies. The I've been that product manager and I've seen plenty of product managers who say, oh, really? Well, that's on my roadmap. I'm going to work on that in the next three years, whether it is or it isn't, is it going to be a high enough priority or not? <clears throat> but they need to be close enough to the CEO and they have to have enough corporate importance to run through many decisions. And also people are like, wow, we made decisions so quickly. Like, did we ask enough other people? Did we get enough other input? And for someone who's senior enough in the organization, they can, they usually have enough corporate sway, so to speak, to just say, yep, I made the decision to green light that company and we invested X million dollars in it. And now they're out in the world. And if, if you're too low in the organization, it's difficult to do that. You don't have enough history in the organization, or you don't have enough span of relationship to make those kind of decisions. But it tends to be a innovation officer, a corp strat, sometimes sits under corporate venture capital because that's the functional place, or and sometimes that corp M and A. Again, just depends a little bit on how an organization is is structured and who owns those general characteristics. And. What's an example of a place where this works really well and a place where this doesn't work well? Mm -hmm. So it's worked incredibly well with Fortis. So I like to talk about them. They're our longest and sort of largest partner. They're a Fortune 500 company. 
18,000 employees, and they live in the industrial sort of measurement and technology category. So some people may be familiar with companies like Fluke or Tektronix. These are corporate, these are sort of operating companies under the Fortive umbrella. And so Fortive had the same sort of idea. Many of their companies are hardware companies, and they really wanted to move into software companies. And some of their operating companies are primarily software, but they wanted to continue to shift the mix into software. Two is they saw lots of opportunity for very rapidly emerging new capabilities in software that may not have the capabilities internally. And so with Fortiv, we work specifically with a woman named Kirsten Paulst and Kirsten reports directly to Jim Lico, the CEO, and she has much of this sort of innovation in internal innovation. And they have a number of different programs internally satisfying new ideas, new business units, new capabilities, as well as external work like we do here. And so it works incredibly well because A, Kirsten is amazing. And Kirsten has been able to sort of nudge the organization and solve some difficult problems because of her seniority. But it also has worked very well because Jim has bought into what we're doing. And Jim has bought into this as an important part of their broad set of innovation strategies. And so having that level of seniority up to the CEO has been really good. We've worked on many different ideas with Fortiv. And now we've spun out, I think, four different, four or five different companies with Fortiv. Whereas where we've been challenged in the past is where there is not a high enough level of seniority and or there isn't the right relationship with the core product teams or the corporate entities. So legal, finance, things like that, where if you're not high enough in the organization, then legal. I mean, we had one corporate partner where we started our engagement. We worked on five different ideas. We ultimately ended our engagement and we never ultimately signed a contract because it remained illegal the entire time. Wow. Because there was all this, well, who's going to own the IP? What happens in this scenario with the IP? What about that scenario with the IP? Even though we've worked all this out, they wanted to rewrite it all in their own paper. They wanted to rewrite it all in a way that sort of made more sense to them. And ultimately we never created anything together, not because we couldn't do the contract. We just couldn't find the right way in which to work together. So it's innovators should seek to clear those pathways and those runways for these companies if they're going to get started. And you kind of built a formula at this point, right? You kind of know how to make it work. I think so. I mean, and we've iterated, I mean, Fortive has been such an amazing partner because every year we've iterated a little bit more on the way in which we can be better. And so this year we added these functions called Sprint Weeks, which was a forcing function to work with a specific business unit to get a bunch of ideas together, to prioritize them, to put push them. And now we're working on one week. Literally, we're going from idea to prototype in a week. And we were doing four ideas in parallel in a week, working with people who are coming from the business units who know about their customers. And it's very exciting for them too, because of how fast we're working here and how much progress we can make in a week's period of time. But that was an innovation that we've added this year. So we'll do two sprint weeks with Fortiv. Out of that, we'll prioritize the ideas. One or two of those will probably move into the creation phase and hopefully they'll become companies. But that's that's an ad that we had this year. We've also figured out what happens if we build a really cool prototype for an idea that actually should just be a feature of one of their core products. So it doesn't have the escape velocity to become a standalone company. Well, what do we do with that? So we've now found a vehicle where they can effectively acquire that back into the corporate. They can add it back into their product. And we're both happy in that use case. So that was another thing that we sort of figured out over our couple of years working together. And obviously the contractual components that support these types of use cases are things that we've continued to evolve upon. And that's a large commitment from their side and our side to continue to evolve the process as well as the products. A couple of weeks ago, I had on the show... One of, and I'll include the episode number in the show notes, but a leader from Plug and Play. Mm -hmm. And what was fascinating to me about Plug and Play is that they had developed this incredible network of corporates to take this almost first dibs approach and product code development approach with the their portfolio companies. Is there some kind of hybrid? I mean, you guys are doing accelerator venture investing right in the studio. Is there... Are we finding this evolution of the venture capital world? Is this what's innovating in the VC world right now is closer connection to first customers than ever before? Well, let's 
pull that apart a little bit. So there's the VC community and what things are happening and being more different in the VC community. So a few things might be happening on pure VCs. Mm -hmm. So one is some of them are going earlier stage and some of them are co-creating companies and some of them are building functional things inside of their own venture capital firm. So you could invert and go from VC to studio or incubator. There are the other direction, which is studios or incubators who are adding the VC function, which is what we've done. You've got people coming like a plug and play who started primarily in corporate innovation and maybe are like, hey, how do we co-create these companies? And so they're maybe adding more functional components of company building, the engineers, designers, data scientists, go to market operations, all of which we have on staff. And they're that that is required to do the company creation part. And so that's happening. And you'll have different people running in different directions. Even some are larger corporations are, are building internal studios themselves or attempting to build studios themselves. The ones that we've talked to of late that have tried the internal studio process themselves have really struggled with a pace of innovation, fractional people, and probably most importantly, finding and, and attracting CEOs, and then ultimately getting a cap table and a, a basically an ownership structure that allows to incentivize the right CEOs and get it externally funded. And that's very difficult to do in an internal way because the corporate sort of, I'm now an employee of Corporation X, doesn't fit that standalone company equity orientation. And they oftentimes say, yeah, it's kind of fun. And we did lots of cool sprint weeks and we came up with lots of cool prototypes, but none of them ever became companies. And then if they ended up back in the product teams, they slowly kind of withered and died because there's no one there to continue to push them forward. So again, our orientation is we're trying to get standalone venture scale companies where we and our corporate partners own and a meaningful amount of equity. And therefore, many of the strategies we do are working backwards from that eventuality. Yeah. Even if the corporate investor is not a customer. Correct. Yeah. In many cases, they're not. So there are a number of ways to think about how to create ideas. So one would be this corp strat, right? Which is what category do you want to be in and that we're not currently in? Okay. That could be your Weston hotels or Starwood. And you're thinking like, why did we not create Airbnb? Okay. That could have been something that could have probably been difficult to do internally, but I think this is an emergent trend. So why don't we try to create something like that? And I could probably, even in hospitality, you could probably list 20 different things that are emerging already as startups that a large hospitality brand may or may not be able to do internally. That'd be what I would call corporate strategy orientation. Two would be more of a, we have lots of customers who need a thing, but we don't have that thing. So let's just play down this. So for many people who are familiar with like TripIt or Ramp, like good products like that, that theoretically could be offered by Starwood. I'm not, not going to pick on them at all. I'm just picking a theme. And you could say, wait, wh why didn't we have like an awesome travel planning thing that works with our brand? Sure, but works with all the different brands. And we should be co-creating that thing. But is it going to happen internally? No, that should happen externally. But we, wow, we know lots of customers who might like to buy that thing or we can get to lots of customers. The next theme is what we call first best customer. So these are oftentimes internal things. There are internal problems that a company has that they have not found a good solution for that they would want to be the first and best customer for, but then they, by its very nature, they want to spin it out. So imagine a carbon accounting for your supply chain product. Like, okay, we may really care about that, but we've not found a good solution for it. And it doesn't make sense for us to build it internally. We should build it externally and be the first best customer. And the last theme might be unique data asset. So if you have something that you believe could be really valuable, let's say you were Ford Motor Company, you had millions of miles of all different types of things. And you're like, God, we know all this stuff, but or maintenance records for all different kinds of cars. We don't know how to turn that into a company, but we have a unique data asset that could be the ingredient to an important company, especially in a time of AI where unique data and training data is so important. Many corporates have gigantic amounts of data that they could spin into another kind of company. Those are four different ways that corporates could think about ways to inspire new ideas. Corp Strat, where they have access to unique customer, aggregated customer demand, where they're a first best customer, or where they have unique data assets, all of which we've built companies around. Really, I mean, it's so fascinating the way this is all evolving. And 
really new opportunities for large corporates to dip their toe in the water around, around technologies that they can perceive as one to watch or potentially a threat or something they want to get in on. And it kind of runs alongside the business until they're ready to fully embrace it too, right? I mean, it's a huge learning opportunity. Yes, that's right. And and that's what we recommend to you. You asked about advice I give is, first of all, you should do this and everything else. Should you be investing in early stage startups with corporate? Yes. Should you be buying more companies? Yes. Should you have lots of internal programs and run your own sprint weeks and come up with new ideas? Absolutely. And you should do, if your checkbook is big enough, you should do all of these things. Now, if your checkbook gets smaller, you can start to pick and choose based on your own strategy of what ones you want to invest in. But I highly recommend running a studio alongside a set of internal innovation programs because you'll learn from both. And in many ways, if you think that a market is going to evolve, then you probably want two or three or four shots on goal. You want an internal thing. You want an external thing. You want an investment in another company. You want to invest in a venture capital firm that invests in other those things in that category. So in many ways, if you said like, we want to expose ourselves to the best and many different potential outcomes here, and it's not really that expensive relative to doing all the other stuff to work with a studio to create these types of companies. And I guarantee you, and Fortive would tell us how much they've learned from watching our process, our decision-making, how quickly we can build things, how quickly we can kill things. They've learned a tremendous amount from that. And we've created companies and the equity in those companies may in fact be valuable enough that they'll, all the program comes for free. That's strategic value for sure. Yeah. And there may also be economic value in a way that starts to materially contribute to certainly the innovation category. And then if all things go well, it will contribute meaningfully to the bottom line of the company too, over many years in the future. Yeah. And it's interesting for CFOs to begin to contemplate these kinds of measures too, is where are we putting our, what is our risk basket? What is our risk tolerance? And where do we need to be out in front even for that next earnings call? So I'm so inspired by this. So, but it's time TA for our hot seat questions that I ask all of my guests on the show. So, and by hot, I mean, relatively lukewarm. So <laughs> my first question is what is the greatest innovation of all time? I'll say harnessing electricity. And if you had the opportunity to be on an innovation team at any time in human history, which team would you have joined? I'm going to, I'm going to go with a, a recent example. So I think what Neuralink is doing is fascinating. I'm a big quantified health person. <clears throat> I'm a big mental health person. And I think that the merging of computers in our brain is going to happen. And I think that team is probably the furthest along in this category. And we just keep hoping those monkeys continue to survive that they're currently testing this. On. New Yorker had a very interesting article about yes. that. <laughs> well, we shall see. But fascinating to be part of that team nonetheless. Absolutely. And what's something that really annoys you or something that you just wish for the goodness of humanity would be invented? I think that we all would benefit, and I've worked on this idea a couple of times and I really want to continue to work on it. I think we would all benefit by having a much more dynamic personal health record so that all of our information about our health was sort of being passively or actively co collected, that we were able to predict our life and our own productivity and our own health span in much more effective ways that we could learn at scale from what is being learned on the internet, uh, whether that be on the research side or you and I comparing ourselves or me comparing myself to an Olympic athlete or otherwise. And this could all happen in the form of a dynamic, smart, personal health record. And I would love to, I almost built that company or almost started that company. It's another story for another day, but I'm still, I think that every single person on the planet would benefit from that type of a product. Fantastic. I'd just be happy if my doctor had my last blood test results when I walked into the office. That would be <laughs> super, super. Well, T.A. McCann, thank you so much for joining me on the show. If people want to get in touch with you, if they have a great idea, where should they reach you? Yeah, I'm very easy. Uh, my email address is T-A-M, like total addressable market at PSL.com. <laughs> right in there. And, and, Tam. And very Tam at, Tam at PSL.com and very easy to find me online, LinkedIn or otherwise. I'm just going to say it's a coincidence that you're in the Northwest and PSL and Pioneer Square Labs and Pumpkin Spice Latte share the same initials. I think it's a beautiful thing. 
so much for joining me today. You're very welcome. Appreciate it.